We have Rafael Cortez on the call. And Rafael, I appreciate your time. We're going to talk a little bit about some wholesaling tonight. I know that's a very popular topic, especially with some of the newer to real estate investors that are listening. But before we do, I want to make sure to direct everybody to your uh, website. So reiwholesaling.com. I'll make sure to have that link in the show notes. But Raphael is also very active on Instagram. So look him up, Pulse. Is that oh, right? That, no, that's a nowadays uh, uh, handle. It's Raphael. R E F A E L Cortez C O R T E Z C E O. So it's uh, Rafael Cortez C E O. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll make sure to update that at least in the show notes. So I really appreciate your time. I've had some of your counterparts on the show. We've always had a great conversation. Um, but uh, you've been doing this for quite a while here now, and you have kind of an interesting background. So let's start there. Yeah. Well, first off, thank you for having me on, uh, Jack. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I, I jumped into uh, real estate uh, back in 2009, right? Um, and um, I started doing fix and flips and, and eventually found my way into wholesaling. So I kind of started backwards. Usually people begin wholesaling and then they'll fix and flip. Uh, but I had a, I was running a, a couple other businesses back then. And uh, I, wanted to, I knew I wanted to park my cookies right in, in the real estate space. So that's that's how it all just kind of came together, and uh, and and uh, I mean yeah that's that's a premise. In 2013, I started wholesaling uh, and really fell in love with the idea of just you know flipping invested interest instead of flipping hammer or you know swinging hammers around and and dealing with with people. So I, I kind of fell in love with that particular process uh, and went to town you know with that over the last uh, you know ten years or so. <laughs> so you're an organization organizational psychologist, right? Yeah, so a uh, I'm a business psychologist. That's my background. So I, I started. I launched my first business when I was 21 years old, um, and uh, through the process, I I went I went back to school, got a bachelor's in business administration. I got a, my first master's in uh, general psychology. So you have to go through general psychology, and then you uh, you can you know pick a specialty, and I picked business, right? So um, it's uh, it's a combination of uh, people and systems. Uh, and how it all connects at a psychological level. So, so uh, I mean, it's pretty, I, I geek out on that kind of stuff. Every time I say it's pretty interesting, I get, you know, people that kind of nod their face, but, uh, <laughs> but it really is, it really is to me. Just under, understanding, uh, uh, you know, human nature at a deeper level and then how to connect that with uh, business processes and models. I mean, what we do as entrepreneurs is try to figure stuff out uh, so it works, you know, uh, and flows, right? Uh, think automation, think, uh, think delegation. How does uh, any, uh, any of that happen uh, if there's no uh, synergy between the, pe- the person and then the process behind it? So that's what it all you know, kind of compiles into. Well, that kind of leads me into uh, the, my first question, because I find you know, your business background and, if you, and you starting a business at such a young age, I kind of find it interesting that a lot of, especially when they get into real estate investing for the first time, they almost treat it like a hobby or oh, yeah. something they're trying to dabble in. And I really like the concept of treating it as a business from the beginning. So what are some of those priorities that they should watch out for when essentially they're starting a startup? Well, I, I mean, I think you're hitting the nail right on the head. And it's actually the, uh, you know, <clears throat> for lack of a better phrase, it's a premise for for what I coach, right? For what I teach. It's, it's um I have a, a long-standing fight against the, the hustle mentality. I think the hustle mentality is it, it's a tool, right? It's going to get us from point A to point B, and it's going to get you results, but it's not sustainable. And, and it's, it's all fine and dandy if you're looking at, you know, at getting into something for, for a short term, but long term, uh, it's going to burn you out. It's going to wear you out. Um, and it's just not something that can be done, you know, for a very long period of time, meaning, you know, trying to figure things out and running from the, uh, from, uh, from the sense of uh, glorified sense of hustle all the time. You have to build systems. Uh, you have to build a process, uh, a foundation uh, that you can build on top of and then automate, delegate and elevate. So it, it's, um, it's really my, uh, my, my key thing, I guess, some of the biggest things to, to, uh, to kind of keep in mind when somebody's jumping into uh, real estate, wholesaling, or whatever business, um, it, it's it's understanding that um, you can create a platform for wealth, right? And then seeing it that way. Um, when you start seeing it uh, as a, uh, you know what, I think this is how it works. And I'm going to figure this out. 
Uh, and then you do the same thing for the next deal and then do the same thing for the next deal and figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. But you're not documenting, you're not uh, testing, you're not tracking KPIs, you're not seeing the methodical approach to anything that you're doing. Um, you have to start all over again every single time, right? And you can't, you, I mean, you, you're, that's a rat race. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, you as a solopreneur, you're still caught in the rat race. Um, and, um, and having the, the mentality, or, well, the bad thing about that is it creates habits, Right. So you're going to create that habit. But if you have that mentality from from the get go, you're probably going to end up in a space where you're just wearing yourself out. You may have some financial freedom you know, to a degree, but not the time freedom um, that you're going to need to spend that money. So I, I, I don't know. I like to to find the um, to argue, like be the devil's advocate between the counterbalance of the two, uh, which is time freedom and financial freedom. And I think the only way to get to those two is to actually have a a methodical approach of doing things, building a system, putting it in place um, and then working and plugging people into it. Right. So as you go. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's kind of interesting you say that because I've, I've thrown this concept out quite a few times and, and the people are probably tired of hearing me say this, but we, <laughs> we live in a society that almost romanticizes the hustle, you know, oh, yeah. we, you know, and, and we have a lot of gurus that make a living on push, 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 hustle, 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 yeah. Why do you think is there so many people that are attracted to that mentality? I, I think it's it's a, a glorified sense of of uh, what's next, or it, it's uh, it, it can come down to a sense of achievement, right? Now we all we all have a need for validation. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, there's going to be a need for validation, um, and and I think having people acknowledge that hustle it's it's a it's a good thing it's a trigger right i mean we get a dopamine injection out of that kind of, that kind of stuff uh and then you validate you know your abilities to do something especially if you're coming in from a from a corporate or, or a nine to five right and then jumping into your uh, doing your own thing uh it, it's like you just became a whole different breed uh, of human it's just you know that's that's really how it works <laughs> because uh now you're you're betting on yourself right but i think what gets us <clears throat> Uh, for the most part, to take action in that direction, it's it's the the believe in that hustle. I think people believe more in the hustle than they believe in their own capabilities, right? So if mm -hmm. I have, you know what, I, I may not be the smartest guy. I may not know what I'm doing. I may not know this, may not know that, may not know the process, may not know the people, may not have the, the network, may not have the money, but I got the hustle. You know, it's that uh, it's a, that's why I'm saying it's it's a great tool. It's a great, um, you know, way of getting, you know, breaking into the space uh, and working through that survival stage that usually happens at the beginning when you're when you're launching a business, right? Why? Because you have the hustle. We have the ability to figure things out. Now, uh, long term, it's just you know the reality is it's just not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, in in my ideal world, I'm looking to create a business. I want to create a business that gives me the time freedom and the money freedom um, that, you know, that I want. I want to own my options. Uh, if I'm always caught in the hustle and I do that for five or 10 years, um, you know, people just stop doing things. And and then next thing you know, any efforts of a business kind of went out the window. So so it's it's a it's a beautiful, I think it's a beautiful stage, especially if you're bootstrapping because you're learning a lot, you're growing as an individual, uh, you're getting into different circles, especially in real estate, man. As you start getting more deals through the uh, through the uh, through the door and you start going to uh, uh, real estate association meetings and then you join a mastermind and then you, you oh I met this guy that just connected me with this other person. Now we're doing a JV and we're tapping into multifamily and commercial, like it, it moves really, really, really fast, right? Um and um and it's a beautiful stage to 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 be in uh, for a while, but you have to you just got to evolve out of it. Just as fast as everything else is moving around you, you have to move your your skill set to a different uh, to a different level. Also, as a hustler, you're not going to have the uh, the acuity or the patience to deal with uh, your team like a leader needs to uh, you know uh, work with their team, right? There's different uh, requirements. It's just it, it calls for a different version of you whenever you're you're scaling, you're leveling up. So. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you said that because, you know, as we get into real estate investing, we did this in order to achieve some level of freedom. And, mm -hmm. and I know we always associate with that having more money in our pocket, but typically that is to buy more time. You know, you want more time right. with your family or pursuing other things. And then I, I would guess that when you're, when you were talking about defining your processes and procedures procedures and doing some of that documentation 
it, it's also that exercise of seeing what is actually important and actually defining some of those money making activities. That some of the hustle that I found a lot of people do are things that are just just for the sake of being busy. You know, it's not oh, yeah. actually money generating activities. Oh yeah, it's there's a big difference be, be, <clears throat> between being efficient and uh, being productive, right? It, it's I mean, you can be super efficient at uh, I don't know, folding letters and fold a million letters in, in an hour, right? But what about, you know, productivity? What, what is that giving you back? What's the, what's the return on that? Um, and, and I think we can get caught up in busy work. Um, almost uh, one thing that I come across so frequently, um, it's, um, it's students who, you know, they've, they've used to, they're used to, uh, you know, being and operating under the hustle mentality. And then they've had those habits, you know, for a long, long time. And we come in and we start doing things a little different. We start working and getting results through people as opposed to just through us, meaning uh, we're switching from that, uh, you know, hustler mindset to that leader mindset and entrepreneur mindset where we have to become more coaches. Uh, you know, we work more on, on pace setting, you know, the, the tempo of the, of the, now the company it doesn't matter if you have only one or two people in it, right. You're pace setting, you're doing a couple of different things, a little different. And what happens is that, they come back as like, man, I feel like I'm not, I'm not doing anything. Uh, I just, I, I don't know. Like, what do I do with my time? Like, I, I feel like I am not doing anything. Why? Because they're not cold calling, you know, for eight hours a day. Um, and they plug somebody else into that spot. Uh, why? Because now they're, they're, pre-qualifying their leads and having a linear uh, process to the whole thing. And then talking to maybe 10 people a day when they were used to talking to 50 people who, you know, was not making any sense. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it, it really kind of narrows things down to, to, um, to quality and then working uh, through people uh, to get the results and have that productivity and then leaving out some of that busy work. Actually, most of that busy work, you end up with about 20% of the tasks, uh, typical 80-20, right? But uh, you end up with about 20% of the tasks that you were used to doing when you when you automate delegate. Yeah, no. And, and you know, I had to revisit this one because I had to write it down. I, I, I love the series of words there, automate, delegate, elevate. Yeah. That, that's, that's really, in a nutshell there, that's, that's a lot to say and a lot to consider <laughs> right there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the, uh, that's a machine, right? It's, it's the, uh, in my head, it's the, that's, what's going to allow us to, to keep striving. And it, it really connects at a psychological level. It really connects with entrepreneurs because uh, we're, we're automating the stuff that's automatable, right? We're automating, um, I don't know, the processes for lead generation. We're automating uh, uh, thresholds and offers and math and calculators, and we're automating all these things. Whatever cannot be automated, uh, what uh, needs to be delegated, right? And then you have, you have, uh, we have soft skills and hard skills. So whatever is a hard skill, meaning that it's something that can be counted, come, you know, something that's very pragmatic, can be automated for the most part. Soft skills, which are people skills, right? And those usually have to be delegated. <clears throat> and then uh, meaning, for example, an acquisitions, a good acquisitions rep is going to know how to navigate a conversation, but you can't really automate that. Like you have to delegate it to somebody else. You plug people in for the delegation. What happens is that as an entrepreneur, when you're coming into it, even uh, even if you started as a solopreneur, but this is kind of like the, the full circle that I see, right? Uh, you start a solopreneur and then you're doing stuff and you're learning. And again, you're you're evolving along with your business and you're going to masterminds, you're growing as a person. Uh, you're like, oh, you know what? I, I was used to doing acquisitions. I don't want to do acquisitions no more. Um, and I'm going to delegate that to somebody else. I was, I was used to cold calling. I'm not going to cold call anymore. I'm going to delegate that to somebody, uh, somebody or automate that or do, to a company outside or delegate it to somebody in-house. Dispo, you know, you start evolving, kind of progressing through these roles, um, but your, your mindset does the same thing. You start having a mind shift, right? And what happens, you get to a point where what you're doing in your business is, is just becomes a task as opposed to the purpose and the goal. And what happens? You find a new purpose and you elevate. You move on to the next thing, but you have to automate and delegate first before you can elevate to your next, uh, you know, venture, next purpose, next level, right? And that's that's uh, that's where that comes from. But but I think it really sums up in in, uh, in my opinion the uh, the uh, like the journey of an entrepreneur. Sure. Now, before we continue here, I just want to make sure everybody heads over to your website rei wholesaling.com for some more information. And if you'd like to connect. Uh, with Raphael and his team, uh, this is going to be a great place to do so. So reiwholesaling.com. 
So, you know, you've been working with a lot of entrepreneurs and that entrepreneurial mindset. I find that a lot of entrepreneurs, they are in the hustle and bustle, the daily operations, and it becomes their baby and it's hard to let go. Uh, yeah. What what's some of the processes or thoughts there to get people on the mindset to eventually get to that elevate that you're talking about? It's uh, it's funny, but a lot of it comes down to ego. Uh, it's either, um, you know, ego getting in the way of, of, you know what, I do it better. If I want something done, I got to do it myself. Um, and, and, you know, that's the first uh, kind of mental barrier, right? Or it's going to be fear on the opposite side. Oh, you know what? I'm not going to have the results and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm not going to make any money. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to, uh, to prioritizing rights. Uh, right. We have, we have different priorities at, at set stages. We have different stages as we progress through the business. Um, and I have, like, I have those outlined, right. But we have different stages and each stage will call for, for priorities in a certain order. And you're going to have certain challenges uh, in a certain order. Understanding, I think having clarity over, over that, that kind of stuff and, and understanding what's coming around the curve it's going to relieve some of that, uh, some of that fear for one. Um, and then the other part is just have to work through it. You, you kind of understand. I mean, we become bottlenecks. We become bottlenecks to our own businesses. Uh, it's uh, the, the old adage, right? He's a victim of his own success. Uh, yeah. Cause now he's working, you know, 18 hours a day cause he can't stop. Um, it, it's, I mean, that's what it really comes down to, but uh, it's either going to be one of the two, right? The ego kicks in and then I can do it better than, than anybody else can. So I have to do it uh, or the fear of loss. So understanding that those are the two biggest things playing into it when you when you have that grip on control and you can't you can't um, uh, release it right um, it, it's it's it really comes down to that I think right yeah no it, it, that makes a lot of sense and and we it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before you know the the concept that you've you've kind of created your own job and you're you're in that hustle as soon yeah. as you have a health issue. You get sick for, with with the flu for a week, income stops. You know, you 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 kind of create a problem there, and it becomes uh, perpetuates this bottleneck you're talking about. Oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. You can't. Uh, uh, I mean, you take a vacation. You have to put everything on on hold, um, unless you have you know a system in place, a process. You got to build a machine. You have to build a machine. Like, there's no way around it. Yeah. I mean, that's how, uh, you know, the biggest uh, or successful, you know, uh, companies do it. It's not, it's not a one man shop. It's, it's a, it's a collective effort of everybody kind of, you know, playing into it. So I'm sure a lot of people are going to give me ribbing if I don't ask you some questions regarding actual wholesaling and talking to uh, uh, (laughs) distressed sellers. So let's, let's spend a little time there talking about you know, I'm curious, based on your experience now being uh, uh, an organizational psychologist, how has that helped you in establishing what your uh, buyers and, and sellers, for that matter, would need to know when talking to like distressed owners? Oh, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, honestly, it's been one of the biggest, um, biggest tools. That, I, that I can they can tap into and, and it doesn't have to be as complicated as that I mean I kind of went overboard with it just because it's aligned with my career uh, but I under I started understanding uh, getting very proficient with uh, disk set, uh, disk profiles sure. uh, to the point where you're you have the ability to read somebody you know somebody else's personality and and understand how they communicate and process information but that's one of the biggest yeah we have scripts we have pre-qualifiers we have all that stuff right but understanding how people communicate it's one of the biggest, biggest things that you can do to improve your, your closing skills. Uh, and that was, I mean, I started off, I started off as acquisitions. I actually, uh, I, so I closed a couple of wholesale deals by myself in 2000, I think that was 2012, 13, I joined a company and as acquisitions, I sold my business in 2014. So I was overlapping between the two for a while, but, uh, but I started doing acquisitions and that I, I, I started to put in a lot of reps right? Uh, just face-to-face, uh, understanding this profile is this assessment. You have drivers, you have you know, influencers, you have steadies and, and supportive, so same thing, and then analyticals. And, uh, and understanding how each one of the main uh, behavioral traits you know, plays into communication. Uh, so I, I, I used to be of the, uh, uh, the, the school of thought that if somebody wasn't doing the same thing I was doing, meaning smiling or, or being all happy and energetic, and I'm like, they just don't like me. 
they don't like and it's it's not true it's completely you know it's completely absolutely not true right um it's just it comes down to uh to behavioral strengths and personality so that plays a lot into understanding how people communicate uh how when you say something you know it's going to be caught and on the other side of the table so understanding being aware of that you know but having social awareness is one thing right being able to understand um communication patterns and and personalities is different so if anybody can you know reach out to to any um you know trainings or books or i mean i've 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 consumed just about everything that's out there on, on that kind of stuff uh, for that same reason, because it, it is, it, it's really a cornerstone of, of um, the, the success that I've been able to have um, at an individual level. And then also building up the companies and understanding my, my, uh, my students. So you're the, one of the first people to mention the, the concept that the, that everybody has a different way of communicating yeah. how, you know, and we already talked, you already mentioned, you know, the, uh, vetting a few of those type of leads out in with some some standard scripts, but when you're face to face with people, what have you learned to be the best situation there? You know, if you're dealing with somebody and your personalities are very different, what should you do? So, so uh, I'm I'm gonna go. Um... I mean, that, that's a rabbit hole conversation. Uh, but, of course it is. But, yeah, it's, um, but to kind of sum it up, I mean, you can, you can tell if you're face to face, you can tell a lot from how the conversation is going by body language. Um, the, uh, one of the things that, for example, it's always happening. This is, this is one of those like kind of little hacks. It happens fast. Uh, people don't um, really realize they're doing it. But when somebody's fully, uh, fully vested in the conversation, they're facing you, right? Uh, their toes are facing you. Uh, so they're, they're facing you, their whole body's facing you. Um, I don't know if you can picture this, but you know, how many times have you been, uh, you know, at a place where you really wanted to leave and somebody stops you right before you leave, uh, your face may be, you know, pointing to them, but your toes are pointing towards the door. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's something subtle, right? Unless you're looking for right. it, you don't really catch it. Uh, and, but it's, it's one thing that, uh, if you're negotiating, if you're talking to a seller, um, and then they, they turn their toes away. I mean, you lost the, the, uh, the connection there with them. So that's, I mean, it's definitely not building rapport. Um, and, um, and it's really like an indicator. What you do is, is you backtrack it. So you backtrack the conversation to before, you know, whatever it was you were talking about before that happened. Um, and then you're, you, you get to a point where you're able to navigate the uh, the conversation as opposed to you know that boiler room you know type of setup where you're closing 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 uh, it's really navigating through okay cool you're breaking down re uh, rebuttals even before they happen just because you're reading the body language um, another one too is um, we have um, pacifying movements so for example uh, you have you know we're babies right you know, like babies have a, a blanket a doll or something that they grab onto whenever they feel anxious uh, pacifying movements with uh, somebody when you're standing face to face look a little different they can be somebody like for example t uh, touching their neck uh, grabbing their ears uh, maybe rubbing their arm with the opposite arm um, you know something that's pacifying indicative of of, uh, of putting themselves at ease right that's that means it's not necessarily concerned, but it's they're getting anxious. And again, what you do is you see that you pick it up and you backtrack a little bit from it and pick up the conversation. So you keep it amiable, and that's like that's the power of effective communication. It's not about manipulation. It's not about any of that stuff. It's it's about understanding uh, how what you're saying is being conveyed. All right, um, and, and of course, isopraxis, uh, isopraxism, which is mirroring. I mean, you you mirror the other person's uh, body language. And, and it's like that, that'll create a certain degree of connection. But when you, when you pick up that they're mirroring you, meaning that they're doing the stuff um, that you're doing with your body, for example, if you're standing and then you cross your arms and then five seconds later, they cross their arms. Uh, it's a subconscious movement on their end. Um, that's when you know that you have rapport, not when you have a two hour conversation about football or the Phoenix Suns or whatever, like anybody can do that. Right. But when people start operating at a subconscious level and they align with you, uh, for example, like in mirroring, 
And then you know that you have, okay, cool. We have a connection. We can move on or take the conversation to a deeper level. And then, you know, strategically, right. You start, you know, asking discovery questions and, and teeing up for your, um, uh, for your offer, if that's going to be the case, pre-qualifiers and, and that sort of thing, but you navigate through that conversation. There's also ways, I mean, there's a ton of ways of doing that um, over the phone as well. Mm-hmm. So. No, that that's especially interesting. So when you were talking about, uh, you know, where their toes are, are pointing and their bodies pointing versus their head, um, would you say that would be also as a as a person going in there and trying to build rapport? Is that one way that we could consciously make an effort to help build rapport is that we make sure our bodies are pointing to that individual. I, I know I catch myself in a chit chat situation and I might be focused on moving to the next part of the house, but when they're talking, I should essentially direct all my attention to them. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're going to have an opportunity to walk the property. Right. And, uh, but you're not going to have the opportunity at, uh, on demand to really create that connection with them. Um, and you, if you break it off, you know, soon because you're in a rush or, or, you know, that, that can really cost you the deal. Um, and it, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's easy to pick like, uh, intentional, uh, mirroring. Uh, so it, it's not, you know, it's not about, it's not about us going in there and then doing mimicking everything that they're doing, right. Like a robot. It, it's mm-hmm. not uh, how it works, but, um, when you, uh, when you pick up, okay, the, this person, you have to show interest and you do it in a couple of different ways, right? For example, one subconscious way was, you know, the toes uh, pointing towards you whenever you have, you know, somebody's talking to you. Uh, a way that you can express interest is you leaning into the conversation, literally physically leaning into the conversation a little, uh, you know, a little more. Um, and it's a gesture of attention, right? So what happens? And like, you're in there, you're in that box. It doesn't matter if there's, you know, 52 other things happening over here. Uh, if there's family members, kids or dogs or whatever, which happens all the time, uh, in seller situations. Right. But if you lean into that person, you pay attention to that person, eye contact, and you lean into it, they know that it's you in that conversation. And then from that point, you can pick up what they're doing, uh, from, you know, their side of the table or their tonality in their voice. And there's a couple of, you know, different triggers that happen at a, uh, on the, from a verbal standpoint, um, that help us, you know, kind of figure things out, but yeah, absolutely. So if you have, if you're flowing with somebody, just making a, make a, again, now another thing is that if you come in and then they, they point their toes towards the house or towards the hallway, like they want to go in that direction, just follow it, follow the toes. It's, it's, it's simple. It's a, I know it sounds crazy, but it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a follow the toes. Follow the toes. Yeah, you can't you can't miss with that. <laughs> no, that's awesome. So you know, uh, I do have to uh, ask you one one more question about you know I I can't help but notice that you got rhinos on the, on your back wall there. I, I oh, know yeah. for the podcast listeners, uh, there's a picture of a rhino on Raphael's back wall. What's the what's the significance of that? Um, there's a book called the rhinoceros success and, oh, there's a back there, that red one. Yep. I do. I have one back there. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There it is. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, it's, uh, you can be a rhino or you can be a cow, right? Uh, I mean, it's really what it comes down to, but it's a, it's a good, um, I mean, we, we have this symbol at wholesaling Inc, uh, because we, we charge, I mean, that we, we have the opportunity, uh, Jack, we have the opportunity to really come in and take over some you know, actions, take over the actions that are going to dictate the results that we have, right? We have an opportunity. It's almost at this point, I think it's a responsibility. We have the ability to do it <clears throat> at an individual level and create an impact. Uh, it's almost a responsibility to do it. Um, and and just, you know, the mentality behind it is that you wake up and then you charge. Uh, you don't just kind of, you know, walk around like a cow and eating some grass here and there. I mean, you charge after what you want, you create, you have that strength, you have that thick skin um, and the, you know, the vitality that comes in with that strength, right. Uh, for doing things and getting stuff done. So, so yeah, that's, that's where, where that comes from. <laughs> you use the phrase, it's our responsibility to do it. Can you expound on that a little bit? Oh yeah. There's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of missing. Whenever you come across something that's good. Uh, and it, I mean, I'm not talking just about real estate, right. Uh, you talk about, I don't know, a good restaurant, a good brand, a, group, a good drink, a good whatever. Uh, you talk about it with people, you know, who, who matter, right? People who care or who you care about. 
it's the same thing. Uh, when you when you tap into something that um, that really that you really feel can can have an impact, can really be a be an impact in somebody's life. Uh, more importantly, a ripple effect in hundreds of others. Uh, it's a responsibility to share it, especially if you're in the position uh, where you can uh, come in and then take those actions, right? And I think we, you know, granted, uh, there's turmoil uh, at a societal level. There's all kinds of stuff changing in economy, you know, left and right, and it's just it's crazy out there. Um, but we still have the opportunity to come in and then choose, choose to direct you know, the path that we're heading, you need know, to take responsibility for our own individual actions in our own individual spheres, and then do the best we can with those, right? So it really becomes in my head, a responsibility for, for, for action, a responsibility to commit uh, to, to oneself, because the, um, the ripple effect of that is going to be well-being in the people who are around us, meaning our family, our loved ones, um, or students, you know, if you're coaching, if that's the case. Um, but I mean, I think it really, it, it really framed as a responsibility, like I can't get around it. There's no way I'm not going to wake up in the morning with a fire in my belly. It's just, just, it's just how it is. Yeah, no, that, that's, that was <clears throat> awesome. Just to give everybody heads up, <clears throat> if you get this book, Rhinoceros Success, this is book of more of affirmations versus something you would sit down and, and read. This is something you would maybe grab and start your day with. Uh, great book, but I don't yeah. want you everybody to think you're going to get uh, or so, learn, and, yeah, or learn wholesaling from it. <laughs> right, you're not going to learn wholesaling from it. Yeah, but it, it does. It's a great book to get your mindset right for the day to to charge your head. <laughs> right. So this has been a great conversation. I, I really appreciate your time and, and uh, I hope you'll consider coming back again sometime. And, and before uh, we you. let you go here, reiwholesaling.com. And uh, I warned you it was coming. Is there a question you wished I would have asked you here tonight? As far as, yeah, maybe, maybe the system, the process, the overall process uh, or blueprint of uh, of the wholesaling business. And that's uh, you know how to break it down. I think one of the uh, one of the things that uh, that usually happens with people who break into wholesaling is uh, they they hear a thousand video, or they watch a thousand videos on YouTube, um, and then there's a lot of pieces that are just kind of flying around, right? But there's no clarity. There's no linear process to it. Um, I think a good question would be what is a what is a good flow uh, for a business model, uh, for a wholesaling business model? Uh, which I, I mean, I can I, I can give your audience uh, something to kind of chew on on. on yeah, um, that that'd be that'd be awesome. Um, and and <clears throat> so, frankly, I'm, I I apologize for missing the the most obvious question in front of us <laughs> here, especially we, talking to you. <laughs> no, we uh, we went straight into uh, the meat and the potatoes of, of uh, the psycholo uh, psychology aspects of things. But uh, no, I mean, and I can talk, talk I can talk about that for days. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just to kind of have uh, an idea. Right. I mean, there comes a point. There's a big difference between the hustle and then the, the business mindset. And, and it really starts with with a uh, fundamental, you know, base of what to build on. Uh, for example, understanding that you have six stages in a wholesaling business, it's going to go a long way. Stage number one, it's sourcing. You got to source the leads. Uh, any way you put it, you have to source leads. You have to find those properties, right? There's different ways of doing it. It's, you know, very methodical processes and whatnot. You have cold calling, you have paper click, you have SMS. Uh, there's right ways and wrong ways of doing each of those. But at the end of the day, it comes down to that stage one, which is the sourcing. After you source a lead, you move on to stage two. And that's, um, that's um, converting. So you pre-qualify the leads. That's when you have, you know, the pre-qualifying conversation. <clears throat> we do it based on motivation, timeline, condition, and price. Um, and again, we have, you know, a specific script that we go through uh, to, uh, to pre-qualify those leads. Then the third stage is acquisitions. This is where your whole acquisitions process happens. This is uh, where you start to uh, actually analyze a property and look at, you know, have discovery conversations where you actually start to consider presenting the offers. You don't present the offers when you're sourcing or when you're pre-qualifying. And that's when you lose people. Um, and and it's, not, it's not a linear process, right? And you have um, the next thing, you get the deal locked and then you move on to dispo. 
So you sell the deal. That's stage number four, dispositions. Um, again, you can either just blast that out to your email list or you can create a methodical approach, which we have. We have a 21-day process of, of how to actually dispose of the properties properly. And usually they sell within four to six days. They're gone, if not sooner. But the uh, at, at the end of the day, like most companies or most businesses stop right there, right? They, okay, I sold the property and that's it. That's all I got. Uh, I think it's very, very important to understand that you need to track uh, your metrics. You need to track your numbers, your KPIs, key performance indicators, right? You need to track your reach, your conversion, your cost per lead, cost per prospect. And there's easy ways of doing all that stuff that uh, allow you to stay consistent, you know, with that type of stuff. So uh, stage number five is measuring. You measure KPIs, measure your, um, your, uh, your efforts, and then stage six, you improve. You come back and then you actually have a breakdown conversation, go through a series of questions and you break down deals. Believe it or not, we still break down deals on a regular basis in my company. And you know what happened here? Where, where did we leave money on the table? What could we have done better, right? And that's the stage six, um, which is uh, improving, right? So you have these uh, six stages and that encompasses the whole business model. Uh, of something that can be automated and delegated. Why? Because you can automate or delegate, you know, the sourcing and then do the same thing for the converting. Uh, you can train people and you can actually delegate acquisitions. You can't automate it, but you can delegate it. Um, you can automate some parts, um, but you do that for, you do delegation for that and then dispositions, right? Um, automation can happen on the KPIs part. And then the measuring, it's also, uh, you know, it's a team effort. It's a collective thing that happens. But creating a, a business model like that gives you a framework of where to improve. Uh, more importantly, it, uh, it helps you find out, like, where your bottlenecks are. So, meaning if you don't have enough leads or prospects for acquisitions, is it a converting problem? Uh, is it a lead generation problem? Or is it a sourcing problem? So, you kind of backtrack it to each one of the steps and you can pinpoint if you have people in place, you can pinpoint, okay, this person is not doing, you know, it's clear accountability. It's simple accountability when it comes down to it. Um, yeah. So um, having a, a good uh, fundamental structure of what that is, I think it's very important. I have a, if it's all right with you, I have a PDF that they can download if they go to uh, reawholesaling.com. Um, they can download a PDF, which has the, the blueprint in place and then all the KPIs and everything that they, they uh, people need to kind of watch out for as they're starting off. No, you know, that's the first time I've heard those last two steps. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, I get a lot of people, you know, we talk about wholesaling quite a bit, um, but it's that measuring and improving that I think is missing from a lot of people's plan. Mm. So that's, that's, and, and it's, really, it's really the game changer. It's it really is because if you're not, if you're not aware of that, if you're not aware of what's happening uh, with your efforts and your results, uh, you're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, right? There's nothing to compare. Yeah. So yeah, you, you stay in the same pond. Yeah. That, that kind of takes it from what you originally said, you know, the automate, delegate, elevate, you're not going to get to the elevate unless you do those last two steps. hundred percent. One hundred percent. Well, Raphael, this, this has been great. Uh, again, reiwholesaling.com. Take advantage of Ro Raphael's offer there to download that blueprint. Um, hope you'll consider coming back. This was a great conversation. Absolutely. I'd love to.